Hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of Wandering in Darkness. Uh, for the first time since starting this series, I am having to entirely re-record an episode, <laughs> so I'm hoping that it will be better and not rushed or anything like that, because I'm, I'm pretty pissed that the the last take on this, there was something, something going on in the background, I could not get it edited out, and uh, I think I got the problem solved now, so we'll see. Anyways, today I'd like to talk about just kind of what I mean by the terms stellar tradition and western left-hand path. And these are terms I use a lot. A lot of people have kind of asked, you know, what exactly do they, these mean? They're not familiar with them or they have an understanding that maybe doesn't match my understanding of the terms, even in my personal life. So I thought that this would be kind of a good video to do. So what I call the stellar tradition refers to the metaphysical beliefs rooted in the earliest spiritual traditions of humanity, such as the pyramid texts of ancient Egypt. I do not suggest my beliefs and practices are an accurate recreation of ancient cultures, but rather a modern approach necessitated by thousands of years of new knowledge, cultural change, propaganda, etc. The stellar tradition centered around the night sky rather than the daytime sun, with the most important focus being on major constellations or bright stars, and especially the northern circumpolar stars, which for the Egyptians never sank below the horizon. These stars are part of the constellations we now call the Big Dipper, the Little Dipper, Draco, Cepheus, Cygnus, Cassiopeia, and arguably a few others. But it is important to understand that these are not the constellations the ancient Egyptians themselves saw. And I actually have a video on my channel about seeking the imperishable constellations of ancient Egypt, which will dive farther into trying to identify those stars. It's also important to realize that constellations or stars were the equivalents of the gods. You know, they were the symbols, the visible symbols of the invisible for the ancient Egyptians and other cultures. So, for example, the Big Dipper represented the Egyptian god Set, or Setesh. And whereas all the other stars and gods cycled through the skies, rising and disappearing only to rise again later, the stars and gods in the far north never died or even needed to be reborn. This connected them with immortality and the concept of individual godhood, which was the dead individual as a god or imperishable spirit in the afterlife or next realm. In Egypt, like I said, these stars, especially the Big Dipper, were associated with the god Satesh. The stellar tradition also seems to have valued storms and rains, as before settling into found civilizations, humans were reliant on the waters as the land became increasingly dry. And Satesh was also the lord of storms and darkness. Along with this, to the prehistorical people, the sun was hated as an enemy which scorched and burned. And so between the darkness of the night sky and the sun blocking darkness of daytime storms, we can relatively safely say that the stellar tradition placed a high value and positive association upon darkness. Oh, one book I really highly recommend to dive kind of deeper into this early tradition, by the way, is G.A. Wainwright's The Sky Religion in Egypt. Uh, I think it's one of the best books I've ever read to this day, and I recommend everybody read it. It's very, very interesting. kind of talks about these pre-Egyptian traditions that we had that set was kind of central to. Now, as I talked about in my previous video on Set Redeeming the Egyptian God of Darkness, which kind of went through the God's entire history, early alternatives to the stellar tradition include the solar and agricultural traditions, which emerged into, which merged into one shared identity pretty early in history. So, for example, you see the solar rising with the popularity of the god Ra in the um, fourth dynasty, I believe, especially. And then the agricultural tradition really comes in with Osiris in the fourth and fifth dynasty. And then those two combined as time went on. At the time, the differences between these were illustrated really well in the pyramid texts. And some of the main differences included that in the solar tradition, the individual is recognized as a god themselves after death. While in the solar or agricultural tradition, you'd either be one with a specific god, such as Osiris, remain ruled over by a god, or possibly even cease to exist if your heart wasn't lighter than the weight of a feather. In the solar tradition, the individual is seen as the highest being, but in the solar and agricultural traditions, the individual is a creation of gods that owe worship and subservience to them. And in the solar tradition, there were more checks and balances, such as a king being removed from office or even killed if they became efficient or corrupt. And a master driving force behind the solar and agricultural tradition would be the master servant ideology touched upon by authors like Nietzsche. Again, I really recommend Sky Religion in Egypt by Wainwright. Also, if you do watch my video or read my Redeeming the Egyptian God of Darkness, a lot of the, there's a lot of citations for that in there as well. Um, just so you can kind of start reaching back into how we viewed things before the more common beliefs of Egypt were familiar with kind of gained popularity. 
Now we see examples of the stellar solar and agricultural traditions all interacting in the pyramid text, like I mentioned before, the oldest religious scripture. Most importantly, we can see the remnants of the stellar tradition, which even in Egyptian history would become more absent as time went on. For example, line 153a3c says, Satesh Nepet, hasten, announce unto the gods of Upper Egypt and their spirits, the dead individual comes, an imperishable spirit. If he wills that you live, you will live. If he wills that you die, you will die. I actually got the live and the die part backwards, but the same difference. So basically, Set and Nephthys are literally saying, here comes the dead individual who's now a god, and he's he has power over the other gods to so even choose if they live or die. Verses 304b to 305a, we see a new thing, say the primordial gods. O Enid, a Horus is in the rays of the sun. The lords of form serve him. The two Enids entirely serve him as he sits in the place of the all lord. The dead wins heaven. He cleaves it with firmness. So again, the dead individual is literally recognized by the primordial gods, the very first gods, as being an equal if not greater to them. We can also see examples of the stellar traditions fight against the others, especially the agricultural tradition, all of which um, I dive into more in my video on set that's already on my site or already on, uh, on my channel, whatever. <laughs> For example, verse 146a says, Osiris, that does not gain power over Set, thy son gives, does not gain power over him. And it also says, Horus, you will not gain power over Set, your father will not gain power over him. So this was a very kind of real divide that is well illustrated. And along with Wainwright, I think the other really good one that dives into this part of the pyramid text, um, I believe Griffiths, the conflicts of Horus and Set, um, I think is the book I'm thinking of with the, it has a section specifically dedicated to like, how Osiris set in Horus appear in the pyramid text over time. Now, this is all relevant because I would consider what I'd call the Western left-hand path to be kind of a descendant and modern manifestation of the stellar tradition. So to start, there is kind of a working academic definition of the Western left-hand path, and that's this kind of milieu of spirituality that values individualism self-deification, and a disregard for social norms and values. Now, I personally have two problems with this academic definition. First, first, I do think that this is all true, like all three of these are values. I just don't think it gets really specific enough to understand what the left-hand path is and why it differs from other traditions. The second problem I have with this is I don't think this definition is actually applied. I'm not really going to get into this now, but for instance, if one of the defining characteristics is self-deification, you know, becoming a god, then it seems to contradict the fact that we have, for instance, atheistic groups who do not believe such a thing is even possible or physicalistic groups listed as left-hand path. So I think that we need kind of a more specific definition to get in here to understand what the left-hand path is. And it's probably something I'll be working on kind of more on my professional side, but I'll just kind of leave it there for now and go into my own definition. So I would say the Western left-hand path is a metaphysical path that seeks individuation and separation and values things such as an apathy towards culture, a respect for individuality and subjective experience, a rejection of external dogma, a focus on oneself or a small tribe, pragmatism, doubt, and godhood. And I'm going to go through these uh, each one by one here. So individuation is the evolution of an individual as a separate, distinct entity from everything else. Comparisons can be found in the works of um, Carl Jung and Abraham Maslow, especially the latter's um, self-actualization in his hierarchy of needs. This is the perfection of the true self as something unique from that around it, a realization of how glorious the individual self is in its true nature. Another term for this in the esoteric traditions has been finding and doing one's true will. Now going together with individuation, by separation I mean a desire to be a unique, self-ruled, and isolated individual, rather than someone defined by culture, religion, even family, or any other external source. It's a mix of individuation and separation that leads to true individuality, in my opinion, the likes of which few ever reach in our culture. And that's because, you know, while we pretend that our culture is about individualism, our, we really live in a consumerist culture where everybody want, has to buy the same latest thing or agree with the same famous people or politicians without independent thought. I'll dive into this more in a second, but consumer culture doesn't allow for individualism because if people were doing their own thing, the consumer culture couldn't survive. I mean, it relies on us all buying the same product, such as iPhones, how they're somehow the symbol for like individuality and unique uniqueness, but they're all the same and everybody has them. 
And there's a really good quote from Carl Jung I want to read here. Quote, the fact that conventions always flourish in one form or another only proves that the vast majority of mankind do not choose their own way, but convention, and consequently develop not themselves, but a method and a collective mode of life at the cost of their own wholeness, end quote. And I think that's kind of the great fear of the left-hand path is that, you know, they'll, they'll develop a collective mode of being rather than individuality. Now, apathy towards culture most people seek to align their beliefs, values, morals, and desires with the cultures that they belong to. You know, the cultures are usually based on enforcing this while casting outsiders away, you know, casting those who do not conform as outsiders and comparing yourselves towards them. On the opposite side, we have people who base their whole lives around shocking, upsetting, or disturbing these cultures. So a good example of both of these would be Christian culture. So, you know, a lot of people are trying to be good Christians or at least seem like good Christians if they consider themselves that. And so they're trying to align their beliefs and values and such, even their imagery with Christian culture so they can be accepted by it. On the other hand, I would use an example of musicians such as Marilyn Manson or the band Ghost. You know, they rely on that Christian culture, but invert it to kind of cause shock. And that's where they get their relevance. As much as I like both artists' music, I would say that were Christian culture to disappear, had they had it never existed in the first place, those bands wouldn't even be known, really. I mean, especially like Manston and Ghost, they explicitly rely on Christian culture in inverting it. They're not apathetic towards it. Both of these equally tie one's individuality and self to the culture they are either aligning with or inverting. By apathy, I mean something entirely different. The apathetic individual may have certain desires and such with align with which align with culture and others which do not. The key here is that they come to these on their own rather than because of what they are told to do or not to do. They are apathetic to if culture agrees or disagrees, accepts or reject them. A big problem I have with many modern groups which consider themselves part of the Western left-hand path is that they are still bound to the culture they are trying to shock and invert. I'd say that basing one's behavior on upsetting the status quo still makes one bound to the status quo. And this is why it's so upsetting to me that um, antinomianism has become a defining trait of the left-hand path to practitioners, which, and I completely reject that because that's just, that's essentially how the belief that since you're saved from sin, you basically have a license to sin is how I would describe that. And that, in my experience, does not describe the apathy of the left-hand path at all. So I, I wouldn't even say that. I would just, I think Ghost is the perfect example. You know, like they are as bound to the status quo as the people that they're making fun of, because if that status quo changes, both groups are going to lose relevance. So apathy is kind of the point here. Next value is a respect for individuality and personal experience. So in my experience, most folks only respect individuality as far as it conforms to their own paradigm, while holding a great distaste for individuality that goes against it. And more often than not, the paradigm is bestowed upon them from external sources. Personal experience is only valued so far as it agrees with the personal experiences of other so-called acceptable individuals or authority figures. The problem is true individuality will inevitably lead to unique views that may not line up perfectly with our own. Personal experience is extremely separate and individualistic. I believe that to seek individuality means to respect both your own and that of others, but I also believe we do not need to be so open-minded the brain falls out, as they say. You can respect individual ideologies in general, but reject those which believe they can violate the individuality of others in specific. So for example, pluralism has been a big focus of mine recently where I understand that the path I'm on might be right for me, but not for others. The very kind of pragmatic take, I suppose, that there's more than one right path, that there's more than one reasonable conclusion to reach. And that's taken a lot of kind of time and maturity to accept that it's not my way or the highway, you know. On the other side of that, I still don't respect something like neo-Nazism or fascism or anything that tries to stifle self-actualization. So by respect for individuality and subjectivity, I'm not talking about every single path is equally valid or anything like that. I'm just talking about a recognition of pluralism as just an objective kind of fact of human existence experience. A rejection of external dogma, I think the word external is key here because everybody is going to have dogma. I would even say that part of the goal of the left hand, the western left hand path is to create your own dogma 
rather than accept one that's been bestowed upon you. You see, all people have dogma, but the question is whether you've concluded it for yourself or had it burdened upon you by outside forces. In my case, a personal dogma is to be suspicious of authority. This is not something enforced upon me. If anything, the dogma of my childhood, Abrahamic religion, encourages one to obey authority. Our whole culture kind of encourages one to obey authority. Most people simply believe what they're commanded to, you know, whether it be in areas of religion, politics, education, even their values or science or philosophy or anything else. But we need to look at the source of those things for ourselves. And that's actually something I loved in Byron's Cain is that he, he talks about how seek the source rather than just accepting things secondhand and stuff like that. So for me, like I said, the external part of external dogma is really the key here because it's not just about like accepting what your church tells you or what your school tells you or what your family tells you. It's about what you tell you and coming to those conclusions through your own experience and reason, even if you come to agree with them, like even if your dogma ends up matching someone else's or some groups, at least come to it yourself rather than simply accepting it. That's kind of what the left-hand path values, I would say. By a focus on oneself or a small tribe, I simply mean that we all have those very close family members or friends that we would literally die for. Family or friends who accept us and value us for the separate individuals we are and that we kind of return that respect. And maybe we've even come to share like the same values and stuff like that. These people are far more important to the left-hand path here than anybody outside of that group. There's no kind of focus on a need to save the world or anything like that. It's kind of this more narrow pinpointed focus on that, which we hold dearest. There's nothing wrong with accepting this, in my opinion. And in fact, I would say that it's important to understand that selfishness is a sliding scale from positive to negative selfishness, and that altruism is something that, as far as I can tell, really doesn't exist in the world. Every act is a selfish act. It's just a matter if that act is for a positive or a negative benefit. I think a good example of this is how just last month I was leading uh, Hebrew services for my uh, grandmother's memorial. And, you know, I'm obviously, I'm Jewish by birth, but that's not my religious beliefs at all. You know, I'm not, but it wasn't about me at that time. It was about the family that I hold dear. And so I did it for them rather than doing what I would do for myself. And it's one of the few examples where something like that happened because by tribe, I mean the group people that the left-hand pather who is pretty much puts the self above all is willing to put someone else above them for a time, you know, and help them out and do what they need to. That's what I'm talking about here. And that's what matters. It's not on us to fix the world. It's not on us to be the keepers of our fellow mankind and stuff. It's just about worrying about ourselves and those few that we truly love. Pragmatism is the idea that there are objective truths, but sometimes these are not always as relevant as what works for the individual. I think magic is the best illustration of this, where symbols, languages, pantheons, and so on may be more effective for use by one individual than another. For example, I acknowledge the existence of Set, but symbols I use to connect with him, others might not, such as the seven-pointed star or the inverted pentagram. I only do full-blown rituals rarely and with friends, whereas others feel inclined to do them every day. The point is that there's no right or wrong answers in these cases. It's simply what works best for the individual. The thing is that... we. I'm not saying the left-hand path is about relativism or postmodernism because pragmatism still accepts objective truth. That's the very way it's able to distinguish between when something is objective and when something is pragmatic is the acceptance of objectivity. So there's still a rejection of relativism in postmodernism, but also a rejection of absolute, like you must do it this way or you're, you're doing it wrong which is kind of what we see with the right-hand path traditions. As for doubt, by this I kind of mean philosophical skepticism, which is a, rec a recognition that human knowledge is extremely limited. The skeptics que question whether our senses could be trusted at all, and if we can trust our senses, could we even trust our interpretation of the information they give us? Beyond self-existence, there are very few, if any, absolute certainties, and most of what we believe to be unquestionable is rooted in belief and faith. For instance, even the idea that I am conscious in the way you are right now, there's a manner of faith. I, it's reasonable to believe, like there's evidence and there's reason, I would say, to believe that I'm conscious in the way you are. 
but there's definitely still a faith there because it's not something you could ever know without stepping into my consciousness or experience, which we know is impossible. This means that since there's always faith, there always must be room for doubt. And Crawley had a great poem about how, you know, you should doubt, doubt yourself, doubt everything, doubt even if you're doubting enough, you know, just kind of praise doubt. And I think this is this goes hand in hand with rejection of external dogma, because if you always have that doubt, it's harder to have a dogma kind of enforced upon you. Now, I think the key objection here is that people kind of conflate doubt or faith, I'm sorry, conf conflate faith with fideism, which is belief against opposed to or apathetic to reason and evidence. So when people say faith, they usually think of believing something without or against evidence. And that's that's not what we're talking about here at all. We're talking about a realization that pretty much everything requires some level of belief and faith and that the, with that is doubt. Like that just naturally comes with it. Finally, the value of Godhood is simply the realization and embracing of an individual's personal divinity, each individual's personal divinity. You know, like the book of the law says, every man and every woman is a star. Previously I'd called this self deification and that's a very common term, either self deification or apotheosis which I would define as the individual becoming a god, especially after the material body dies. The problem with this for me is that we are already divine. It's not a matter of becoming divine or we'll be divine after we die. We are already divine beings, simply being limited by matter. You cannot perform the act of self-deification if you are already deified, and I don't think it's simple semantics. One view implies you must achieve some abstract goal to be successful, but you already have that eternal success. It's already achieved. And recognizing what you are is much easier than becoming something you are not. Now, there are plenty who would disagree with the definition of the Western left empath as I believe it out, including possibly the academics that we touched on already. Many simply think that rejecting Christianity or other similar religions makes them part of the Western left empath, even if they are still bound to external dogma defined by culture or accept the modern faith of physicalism the way they once accepted Christianity or similar religions. Some reject the dichotomy altogether, saying that the right-hand path and left-hand path distinction is invalid, or at least that the two terms only apply to religious traditions. Uh, I'll address this in a moment. The main disagreement I've run across, however, is with the concept of the left-hand path itself, as the term originated in the East with Vedic religion. In, both the, in the East, both the right and left-hand paths generally seek submission to some higher force. It's just the methods with, which differ. And there are some exceptions to this rule, but they're kind of beyond the scope of this discussion right now. For example, an Eastern left-hand path tradition may engage in taboo acts such as cemetery rituals to cover themselves in human ashes, but they're still doing it as a way to lose the self into something supposedly greater. The Eastern left-hand path and Western left-hand path are definitely different things, but I believe as long as we distinguish them from one another, all is well. And pretty much all my work is going to be about the Western left-hand path, unless otherwise noted. As I also touched upon, I'd say that the Western left-hand path is a descendant and modern manifestation of the stellar tradition, which we've already discussed. We can see this most clearly in the concept of personal divinity, as well as its self-focused nature. And I think there's many of the many verses in the pyramid text, which almost seem like they could be pulled right out of modern Western left-hand path ideology. For example, verses 658c through 659d says, The dead's step is great that he may traverse the sky. He is not seized by the earth gods. He is not rejected by the planets. Let the two doors of heavens open to him. The dead has no father among men who conceived him, no mother who bore him. And I think even more striking lines, uh, I don't know if it's lines or verses, honestly, to be honest, but 1143b to 1148c. The gods come to the dead bowing, and the spirits escort the dead to his soul. For behold, the dead is a great one, the son of a great one, whom Newt has birthed. The power of the dead is the power of Set and Ombos. The dead is the great bull who comes forth, the pouring, pouring down of rain. The dead comes forth as the coming into being of water, for he is the serpent with many coils. The dead is the scribe of the divine book, who decides what exists and what ceases. He is stronger than men, mightier than the gods. Horus carries him and Set lifts him up. So I would personally say that these very clearly illustrate a, at least ideological connection between the stellar tradition and the modern Western left-hand path. Where again, if you told somebody that these verses had been made up, you know, in the late 1900s by 
left-hand path who was interested in Egypt, I think you would honestly be able to pass that by anybody who wasn't familiar with the pyramid texts. In the same vein, as the, in the same vein, I think we can see the solar and agricultural traditions as a predecessor of the Western right-hand path. In both monotheism and even forms of atheism, the individual is in no way the highest being, but something subservient, if not downright vile, or perhaps just another animal. We certainly are not seen as gods, but low life forms need of saving by such entities, which certainly feeds into the master servant ideology of Nietzsche. The Western right-hand path seeks the opposite of what we listed under the Western left-hand path values. And note that these not only apply to monotheism, but to most forms of theism out there, most views of politics, most cultural preferences. This division goes far beyond religion and spirituality and can be used in many areas of study beyond religion and spirituality. For example, monotheism, political parties, and corporations all do not want individuals who individuate and seek separation. They want well-oiled cogs in the machine, submitting the self to something greater. Personal experience is disregarded. Look at how monotheists only believe their experiences with their God are valid, but not the polytheists, or how that atheists believe that not experience a God invalidates all divine experience. I think another thing to touch on here is that we can even see this ideology in something like a, a modern company, for instance, where you find a faster and easier way to do a process, but because that's not the way it's written in the manual, you're literally not allowed to do it. Like that experience doesn't matter. Commercials for consumer products all want people buying the same things. They themselves are right-hand path because, I mean, that's just how it, consumerism runs. How are, how are they going to stay in business if people aren't all buying their same product that they're releasing? And I think I touched, I don't know if I touched upon this on the first run of this video or on this one already, but it's like I, I look at the iPhone where it's this kind of symbol of modern individualism or whatever for everybody to have identical phones. It's just kind of funny how the right hand path has fueled consumerism and people like still want to say that these labels aren't even accurate let alone apply to more than religion and spirituality you know so i think people are just kind of missing the point and that's really a point i want to hone in here the western right hand path unlike the left is founded on external dogma and that can be of a religion a political party a company or consumer culture and I think here a good example is how company culture always forces incomers to assimilate to it rather than creating a company culture to account for the diversity of its workers. You know, it, it says, well, we care about the individual and blah, blah, blah. But then you have to fit with it rather than it fit with you as an individual. It doesn't actually care about that. It's the right hand path posing as individualism. These institutions do not seek the individual to become a god or to ascend to something greater than themselves, whether that be the church, a political party, a company, a corporate entity, anything of that nature. Some believe that the left-hand path and right-hand path division applies to religion only, but I would say here we can clearly see that it applies to all aspects of life. And I do apologize if I'm fading a bit here. We're reaching the end, and like I said, this is the second attempt to record this whole thing and like edit it and stuff, so... I apologize, but um, just to kind of sum up, I would define the Western left-hand path as a metaphysical, a metaphysical path that seeks individuation and separation and values things such as an apathy towards culture, a respect for individuality and subjective experience, a rejection of external dogma, a focus on oneself or a small tribe, pragmatism, doubt, and self-deification. I would add that I think that academic working definition we have of Western left-hand path right now is not all-encompassing enough, and we don't actually seem to judge or categorize, I should say, groups by those conditions accurately. So it's kind of useless to have anyways right now. I'd also add that the definition used most famously by practitioners, which includes like antinomianism and stuff like that, is also inaccurate because, I mean, that's just... I'd say it's more about a, in that case, specifically more about an apathy than antinomianism, you know, but we've already talked about that already. And finally, I think just to conclude, I'd say that the Western left-hand path is kind of a modern manifestation of this ancient stellar tradition in some ways to me, and that it's very important for me that people realize these divides go far, far beyond occultism, far beyond religion into literally every single aspect of our lives. Anyways, that's about it for today, guys. I appreciate you guys listening so much, and thank you. See you next time.